Well, surprise, it's not Pastor Ron, Pastor Sarah. Well, good afternoon, Union Houston, and welcome. We are still in the Beyond series. It's all about the Holy Spirit, the most misunderstood, mistaught, and misrepresented truth of God. Yet it's the most powerful promise of God. The Holy Spirit is God, the third person of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In week one, Pastor Rod very dramatically showed us how the Holy Spirit overflows in our life and hits the saucer and keeps on going all the way over the stage and all over water everywhere if you saw it. And last week, Pastor Andre spoke on the enemy and the opposition and also the fruit of the Spirit. Both very great messages. You can always go back on our YouTube channel and listen to them. And they both set up today's teaching perfectly. So last week, we got back from vacation and we had to take a, a lift back from the airport because both of our cars both got in accidents, not our fault, and they were in the shop, so we had to take a lift back. And, you know, I am not an experienced lift rider or Uber rider. I've never been in one. However, my husband drives lift for extra money, and he does so because he likes to dress nice. He likes nice shoes, and, you know, he has to make extra money to buy those things, so he drives lift to make extra money to buy those things. So, what I know about Lyft drivers is what I know about my husband. So I'm expecting, in my mind, our Lyft driver to be outgoing, personable, chatty, friendly. I mean, he comes home with these really great stories of all these people that rise in his cars. I mean, you know, he's, he gets to minister to people. So, you know, I'm kind of expecting the same experience. Well, our Lyft driver pulls up and I have to jump in the front seat because there's four of us. And so I, I open the car door and I'm like, hi. And she's like, hey. And she, she clears off her front seat, seat and she's very annoyed. And I, I notice her car's a mess, but I'm going to give her grace. You know, maybe, you know, she's going to get us safely to where we're going. We all pile in the car. She doesn't introduce herself. She doesn't say anything right then and there. I know something is wrong. Like, this woman is mad, mad about something. I'm like, okay, well, she's going to get us to where we need to go. Like, that, that's fine. So halfway, halfway into the ride, I notice, like, we're, we're just talking amongst ourselves, talking about what we're going to eat. I notice, like, my seat is burning up. I'm like, what's going on? Like, I'm afraid to even ask her about it because she's been so rude so far. But I have to do it. I'm like, is it possible that this, this heater is on my seat and she looks down and she says, yes, it is. And she turns it off, doesn't even apologize, acknowledge it, anything. I'm like, wow, okay, well, we're doing this. Well, five minutes from our house, her face FaceTime keeps going off over and over. And she shuts it down, shuts it down, shuts it down. We're like, what is this? She's like clearly irritated, like mad, mad. She puts her earbuds in her ear and she, she answers a phone call. And she's like, What? She's like, I have a family of four in the car. I can't answer your FaceTime. And like me and the girls and my husband are like, what's going on? Like clearly her boo is calling her and like wants to know where she's at on FaceTime. And um, so she's like, fine, I'll, I'll wait, on the, wait on the phone with you. I'll, I'll be in my destination in two minutes. Give me two minutes. And I literally wanted to be like, ma'am, like answer the FaceTime. Like we'll, we can be like, hey, what's going on? Like, uh, so we pull up to our, our house. We literally get out. Like, she doesn't apologize. Like, say, well, I'm so sorry about this. Like, nothing. We get out. We pull. We haven't even got our suitcases out of the car. And she's like, explosive F-bombs. And, you know, you're going to make me lose my job. And they're going to give me a horrible rating. And blah, 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 blah. And we're just like, shh. We're just shocked. Like, what just happened? What just happened? And so, you know, Rod and I just turned to each other like, one of us has to use this story in one of our sermons. Well, he said he was going to use it. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm going to use it because this actually works out perfectly because, because the spirit that we carry, the spirit that we carry affects the 
atmosphere. It affects it affects the car that you're in. It affects the house that you're in. It affects the church building that you're in. It affects your workplace because it has power. You see, we as the church can dictate the atmosphere around us. We can carry our burdens with us and affect everyone around us. Or we can carry the spirit of God with us. So today, let's jump into the scripture for today. We're going to be reading all of Luke 41, 14 through 30, but I'm going to break it up in sections. So right now we're going to start with 14 through 22. So Jesus returns to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and then the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of the sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him. And we're amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this word that's about to go forth, Father God. I just ask that you open everyone's ears and everyone's hearts to receive a message that you have for them today. Sometimes a message is difficult to hear and receive like a two-edged sword. But Father God, I know that there is someone here today that you have a special download and healing for in Jesus' name. So I ask, Father God, that they be receptive to what you have for them today. I am merely just here as a vessel to deliver your word that you have downloaded into my spirit. So remove me. I get out of your way, Father God. Just use me, and it is in Jesus' name. Amen. Funny story, like Rod was going over kind of the preaching schedule and he mentioned, okay, Sarah, you're doing Holy Spirit. I wanted to preach on this. And so the the very next week he has a message, he preaches and he uses this scripture. I'm like, wait, I'm going to use that scripture in a few weeks. But then God rebuked me and was like, no, I'm talking to both of you like in agreement, in alignment about the same things. And I was like, oh, okay, God, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. But he speaks differently to us. So so this might be similar. You might have heard this maybe five weeks ago, but it's, it's different. So, Just prior to this scripture that we're reading, Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights fasting and praying, just like we're currently doing. And he was tempted three times by the devil and was able to overcome the temptations using the power of scripture. He was coming from his time of testing even stronger than ever. And it's during this time that he actually starts his public ministry. News was spreading like wildfire, and everyone was praising him. He was walking in power and authority and confidence, clearly showing that his ministry was under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Luke makes it very clear in the very first verse that he came to his hometown in the power of the Holy Spirit. So the title of this message today is In the Power. And the wording is crucial to what is about to transpire and the challenges that he is about to face among the people that he knows. You know, we use the word in all the time in the English 
language, but I really want you to understand the meaning here. It is an indwelling, something that is permanently present in your life. It's a power that has made a permanent home inside of you, in the power. It's the Holy Spirit's job to give us Christ-like character. And it's not something that we can do in our own strength. So we must allow ourselves in humility to be led by the Holy Spirit so that he can guide, comfort, and intercede on our behalf. We have access to this very same power that we read here in the scriptures today. So Jesus comes and he reveals in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus finds himself in familiar surroundings in his hometown. Many welcomed him as the hometown hero. He goes to the synagogue, which is his custom. He's done many times before. He stands up. He's, he's given the scroll. He reads from Isaiah 61 where it prophesies the exact things that Jesus will fulfill in the next three years. He then rolls the scroll up, mic drop, <laughs> sits down, and says something that's just going to blow everyone's mind. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is letting everybody know in that exact moment that the prophet Isaiah was writing about him. Imagine being in that exact moment where Jesus is saying among the people, today the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Today I bring good news to the poor. Today I proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Today, I let the oppressed go free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He was announcing the kingdom of God was being released right then and there, just like it's being released today. And then there began to be some grumbling from the audience. And this is what was not sitting right with some people. God's mission was not limited to certain people groups. Jesus just said that all people were part of the kingdom of God. All people. All people. In September, Pastor Rod's going to be doing a download about what the kingdom of God is like. It's going to be good. Jesus taught with authority. And many were amazed at his words. And they were excited about his hometown hero. But some were critical and skeptical. They were sure to bring up, isn't that Joseph's son? He can't possibly be who he says he is. Where did a carpenter's son get such power and authority? And this is a perfect example of how sometimes we have the best intentions of leading our friends and family to Christ, but we may not be the best person for the job. Because the enemy of revelation is the spirit of fami familiarity. The familiarity gets in the way of receiving from us. We can still live our lives like the gospel and share our testimony, of course, and continue to pray for them and be patient with them. But unfortunately, familiarity is a weapon that the enemy uses to stunt the growth of people and the church. One of the saddest things that
Pastor Rod and I have experienced is that people have seen us, and this is just in launching the church specifically, people have seen us as graceful, loving friends, but not as pastors that have the authority to make them into disciples. And it was a big issue in the beginning because the enemy really tried to use the spirit of familiarity to discourage us and get us off track of what God was calling us to do. One of my biggest prayers to God is, God, as I'm ministering to my children, I mean, as to, I'm sorry, as I'm ministering to your children, God, send someone to minister to my children. Because it's difficult to minister to your own children. They are our big, biggest critics. And to be honest, one of the number one reasons that children are leaving the church is because they are seeing their parents as adults claiming to be Christians and acting a whole different other way. And so what happens is their minds as young kids get tainted and they're like, I'm learning in Sunday school about a Jesus that loves people, but I'm seeing from my parents the exact same thing that we're going to be reading in this scripture. And so their minds become tainted. And they're like, I don't want to have anything to do with a church that my parents go to. So it's a very dangerous thing. I mean, look, my, I need my kids to have people to lean on, to leaders, leaders to lean on and speak into their lives as well. I'll tell them something, it goes in one ear and out the other, and then one of their leaders tell them something, and they're like, oh my gosh, I heard the most amazing thing. And I'll be like, okay. But you know what, I'm not mad at it, because at least they have someone pouring into their lives, you know? Plus, they love to remind us to practice what we preach, which is fine too. You know, it keeps us on our toes. So parents, we always need someone in our kid's life speaking life into them as well. We all have a friend or family member that just can't seem to get it right. And it's hard for them to understand what God has done in your lives because they haven't experienced that yet. They see the old you. They, they remember your past failures. They remember doing dirt together with you. And it's going to take a while for them to come around. But we have the faith to believe that they will have their own God encounter. And it's the same prayer. God, as I am ministering to people Send someone to minister to my brother, to my sister, to my friends. It's the same prayer. Both Mark and Matthew are a little more detailed in their questioning. Matthew 13, 54 through 57 says, where does he get this wisdom and the power to do miracles? He's just the carpenter's son. And we know Mary, his mother, and his brother, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And his sisters live right here among us. Where did he learn these things? And they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Well, that sounds like some gossip and hating going on. And it was inside the church. And it's still going on today. How has familiarity made you a criticizer versus a contributor inside the church? Poor Jesus, this is most likely his first public sermon in a synagogue, and it is not going too well. And things are about to go from bad to worse really quick. So Jesus responds in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, seeing 
all these grumblings and objections and attitudes, he comes with them with biblical responses, just as he did in the desert with his fast. This is how you're currently being strengthened during your prayer and fasting. We're so excited to already hear all the great things that have been happening just in the few weeks, and we have one more week to go. We're so excited to celebrate at Night of Hope with you guys. So let's continue on, Luke 23 through 27. Jesus says to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do you hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum? Truly, I tell you, he continues, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elisha was not sent to any of them but to a widow and Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. The quotes he uses, physician, hear yourself, and do hear what you do for others, is very similar in meaning. Jesus is saying that, that they were going to demand that he perform for them to prove that he was the Messiah. He was going to demand, you do miracles here, so I know that you're the Messiah. Because they heard that he had been doing miracles in other places, and they expected the same here in his hometown. But what they didn't understand was that Jesus could do very few miracles there because of their unbelief. Sometimes we get so infatuated with the miracle that we miss out on having faith in the miracle worker. And then it goes on to show two other examples in the Bible of how prophets are not accepted in their hometown through Elijah and Elisha. And they were even more angered that Jesus would compare himself to these great prophets. Because prophets, they point out sin, and they call people to repentance, but then they also point to hope in God. And this just enraged some of the people. And as we respond to negative situations in our life, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. You know, Jesus has the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's able to respond with the fruits of the Spirit, and so can we, with joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all the things that Pastor Andre spoke about last week. So what problem or situation do you need to spend more time responding in the power of the Holy Spirit? So then Jesus then moves in the power of the Holy Spirit. So finishing up this section, Luke 4, 28 through 30, all the people in the synagogue were furious. When they heard this, they got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff, but rocked right through the crowd. He walked right through the crowd and went on his way. <laughs> So, these people went from attending church to running Jesus off a cliff. But, you know, we kind of do that today. We sit in church on a Sunday mad about something. We heard judging someone. On Monday, we're condemning someone at work. You know, somebody cuts us off, we're flipping them off and yelling explicitives and, you know, then we hear something and we're, di we're, we're wishing death on someone and we're speaking death over people with our mouths. You know, we're not actively trying to push somebody off a cliff, but you know what? Our thoughts and our words are just as bad. The atmosphere that we're setting is just as bad. 
And this is mind-blowing to me because the people in the synagogue, their place of worship, are furious, just ganging up, trying to kill him. I mean, how do you go from reading scripture, reading God's word, and praying to God, trying to kill someone? I mean, this is why Christians have a bad name. Let's be honest. They appeared outwardly to be doing all the right things, but their hearts were hardened towards God and his messengers. It's because there's another wannabe power at work here. And they are in the spirit of religion. And this is like the spirit of familiarity. It's a demonic stronghold. And why? Because the spirit of religion will have you taking a legalistic approach to Christianity, never really developing a transformative, deep connection with God or the Holy Spirit. It's always rules over relationship. You can get so wrapped up in your own beliefs and actions that your life does not represent Jesus or the scripture at all. You can be so focused on what you think is right, the law, that you miss out on the simplicity of the ministry of Jesus, and that is loving one another. It's judging one's past or the way they look and deeming them unworthy to be in God's house. And these are all things that we just read in the scripture that happened to Jesus. We also see the spirit of religion in the local church today, and it is scary and it is discouraging. The church atmosphere is dry, dull, lacking the Holy Spirit and direction. And people are in desperate need of freedom, and the fruits of the Spirit are not present because people are struggling. People are feeling rejected and discouraged and hopeless, and they're just looking for fulfillment and all the wrong things. That's why you just Everyone is turning to new, new age and tarot cards and crystals and witchcraft. In this passage, they wanted to kill Jesus. But it was the protection of the Holy Spirit that allowed Jesus to walk right through the crowd and go on his way. You see, Jesus did not have time to entertain their nonsense. And here at Union Houston, Pastor Rod and I will be the first to say, we don't have time to entertain their nonsense. <laughs> Jesus had things to do, places to go, people to see. We have things to do, places to go, and people to see. Jesus immediately leaves there and goes on a nonstop journey of casting out demons, choosing disciples, raising up an army, healings and deliverances, raising people from the dead. And woohoo, that is what Union Houston is called to do as well. The enemy may have death coming for you, but if you allow the power of the Holy Spirit to guide you. He will move you to safety in higher places because there's no time to waste. We have places to go and people to see and things to do in Jesus' name. Just like these people were infatuated to see a miracle, they lost the miracle right in front of their eyes. Jesus escaped them and they didn't even acknowledge it. Acceptance is in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the section I really want you guys to lean in on. Because worst of all, these people knew Jesus. They saw him grow up as a child. 
They still knew his family. We read those scriptures. They knew his family by name. They were his neighbors, his teachers, his friends, the people he saw at the market. These are not strangers. This is a small town where everybody knows everybody. And the underlying theme of this entire scripture is that Jesus was rejected. And this is also a wannabe power that can consume us. It's possible to be under the spirit of rejection. Rejection can hold you captive in your life from experiencing the true joy and peace that God desires for your life. And what consumes us will inevitably control us. And this spirit wants nothing more than for you to stay defeated. And listen to me, stay defeated your entire life. Your entire life. This is where Jesus becomes so relatable to every one of us. Because we have all felt the pain of being rejected by someone. It's the ones that are closest to us that hurt the deepest. deepest. It's amazing how one person can have such control over our lives. Rejection is when you've been wrongly hurt by words, actions, and neglect. And it's important to know that rejection has nothing to do with you or your value and everything to do with the person's heart who has wronged you. Rejection is one of those things that, you know, we could teach hours and days on and I encourage you if if you feel like this is something that has got a hold of your life Rejection can come in, I mean, honestly, the earlier it comes in, the stronger it's got a hold. If it can come in when you are a child, the stronger it's got a hold. If you feel like this is something that's had a hold on you most of your life, I encourage you, not only get prayer today, later on, but we have our freedom small group starting up next month. It is life-changing. Most of our church has gone through it. I encourage you. It'll be the best 12 weeks of your life. I encourage you to make a commitment and sign up up for that. There'll be more information coming soon. Jesus experienced every form of rejection. Isaiah 53.3 says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. It continues on to say that he took on our pain and suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions. By his wounds we are healed. He took on our rejection. He took on our rejection. You know, most of my life, I have been under the spirit of rejection. I've broke it off as an adult. It was from my father from the age of 10, and it just followed me around my whole life. And I had worked through it. And then there was a a moment. It was a few years ago. I thought that I really had worked through the understanding that I wasn't going to get any of the answers of the whys I was always asking. You know, I mean, as a kid, you're like, why'd my dad leave? You know, why'd you have kids if you don't want kids? You know, why, why is everybody, everything else so important? I mean, I, I knew that none of the answers as an adult would satisfy my heart. So I was okay, I was okay. So my dad passes away not too long ago. I go to his funeral. And that in itself was sad. It was a sad funeral. There was not many people there. He had some siblings and of course my sister and I and then our kids. And a man comes up to me. He says, hello, introduces himself. He says, I knew your dad for 15 years. We worked together. And he tells me, 
I didn't even know he had kids. He never once mentioned in 15 years that he had kids. And I was just like, wow. I mean, it honestly didn't surprise me. But I just, in that moment, felt so sad for him. And I told him, yeah, he has kids. He actually has two kids. And he has six grandkids. But I felt so sad because he missed out on so much and died a lonely man. He died a lonely man. But this was the enemy trying to send another attack on my mind, trying to get that spirit to reactivate my mind. But that day, I was walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and I had the acceptance that I needed from my heavenly father, I didn't falter to what the enemy's lies were trying to tell me in my head. Romans 8, 15 says, it's a beautiful scripture, and I hope that this brings some healing to you too. You did not receive the spirit of religious duty leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. See, the spirit of rejection always tells you that you'll never be good enough. But you have received the spirit of full acceptance through our Heavenly Father. Enfolding you into the family of God, you will never feel orphaned. No matter if your earthly parents fail you, you will never be orphaned. For as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, beloved father. Hear me on this. This is so important. All throughout the Bible and still to, to today. I mean, look at Jesus' life. The enemy uses rejection as a way to stop people who have great callings on their life. If, you, if he can place a person in your life to reject you, place a seed of doubt, destroy your confidence, make you think you're not worthy, the enemy has won. But guess what? We cannot let him win. We've got to be like Jesus because we don't have time for this nonsense. There's greatness inside of us. We've got things to do and places to go and people to minister to. Will you stand with me this morning? In a moment, the prayer partners are going to come forth. We're going to have a a time of ministry. We'd love for you to come up when you feel led. There's a beautiful part in the Bible in Matthew 3 where John baptizes Jesus. And as Jesus is coming out of the water and the Spirit comes upon him like an ascending God, a dove from heaven and there is an audible loud booming like thunder voice that can be heard coming from heaven it is the voice of God and it and he says God says this is my son whom I love and I am well pleased this is the acceptance that my prayer is for you to receive today. That God is saying, my child, you are my child and I am well pleased. Receive this acceptance today. Rejection has no place in your life. Receive the acceptance I am giving on your life today because you are my child and I am well pleased. So 